Chadasha, a reading from uh, the New Testament. And so, uh, what a wonderful readings that we've had today as we uh, read from the very last few verses of uh, Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, and then the first few verses of Bereshit, Genesis. But it's on the New Covenant readings that I really would like to focus on today, the readings that we had from the Gospel of John, Yohanan. And in particular, we'll look at uh, verses 1 to 3, but probably some other verses as well. Let's read uh, 1 to 3. Well, let me read 1 to 3 of, uh, of Genesis first. Genesis 1 to 3. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So I love the fact that within these first three verses of the Bible, we can see God revealed in his fullness in these first three verses, we can see, in fact, what we call the triune nature of God revealed. In the first verse, we have God the Father, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God, in the beginning God. So here we see God the Father, the eternal one, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who doesn't need any introduction. It just says, in the beginning God. He's there, he's the creator, and uh, he just is. Then in verse 2, we have the Ruach HaElohim. The Ruach Elohim, Merachefet Al Penei HaMayim. And the Spirit of God, Ruach HaElohim, was hovering over the face, the face, Penei HaMayim, the face of the waters. And then in verse 3, we see the word of God revealed. Vayome Elohim, yehi or vehi or. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke, and his word brought forth creation. God spoke, and his word, and light. Sorry, God spoke his word, and light came into existence. As the psalmist later tells us in Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of Adonai, the heavens were made, and their whole host by a a breath from his mouth. The word of Adonai, the word of God, brought the whole world into existence. And that's an interesting thought. Like the personification of wisdom that we see in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 to, 20, to 31, we see in those Proverbs how wisdom is personified. Wisdom is walking the streets, calling out to those who would be wise. And in a similar way, the Word of God is often personified and assigned divine attributes, implying divine status. In the Bible, the Word of God is seen as God himself, yet also distinct from God. So for instance, in the Bible, when God speaks to the prophets, and we see this many times when he speaks to the prophets, it says in the scriptures, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, or the word of the Lord appeared to Ezekiel. It's very personal. It's as if God manifests himself through his word. Now, in Jewish theology and in Jewish literature, the word of God is often called the memra. Memra, it's an Aramaic word. The memra is the divine creative word manifesting God's power and glory in the material world, acting as his agent and the mediator between God and men. And the term memra is used hundreds of times in the Aramaic targums. A targum is a paraphrase of the Bible, much like we have 
a paraphrase today. One of the popular ones is uh, the Message Bible. It's not the Word of God, right? It's a paraphrase interpretation of the Word of God. It's a, it's a kind of a teaching tool. And so are the Targums back in the day. Uh, there weren't uh, commentators that wrote big volumes of commentaries in the Bible. There were the Targums that interpret the Word of God for the people. And these Targums are quite old, some of them uh, from centuries back even to the time of Yeshua. So for instance, uh, we read about Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. In the Bible we read, uh, so God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. But in the Targum it says, and the Memra of the Lord created the man in his own image. Also in Genesis 3 verse 8 we read, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. And the Targum says, and they heard the sound of the word of the Lord God walking in the garden. And in Genesis 28 verse 20 to 21, again we see uh, the story of uh, when Jacob uh, began his journey and he says, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, I will give uh, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. But the Targum paraphrases it as, if the word of the Lord will be with me, then the word of the Lord will be my God. So can you see how uh, the Targums that were written by rabbis that try to interpret the word of God often replace God with his word. There is God, yet there is also his word, the Memra. And there are hundreds of more examples of this interchanging of God and the word of God, Memra, throughout Jewish literature. In fact, the Memra is seen as a mediator between God and man, and uh, it's reflected in this quote from Targum, Yerushalayim, or Targum Yonatan on Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7, it says, The Memra brings Israel nigh unto God and sits on his throne receiving the prayers of Israel. So that's a pretty interesting quote from the, uh, from the Targum. The Memra brings Israel nigh unto God and sits on his throne receiving the prayers of Israel. And also the Jewish Encyclopedia says, in the Targums, the Memra figures constantly as, a manifesta as the manifestation of the divine power or as God's messenger in place of God himself. So rabbinical thought also links the Memra to the Mashiach. And this is what brings us to the reading from the Gospel of Yochanan, which is a very Jewish gospel, if you like it to call it that. It's written with a lot of uh, Jewish thought and theology. Well, Yochanan, of course, was Jewish, and he's recording words uh, uh, that was given to him by God, but also the words of Yeshua, the Messiah. So right in the beginning of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we read, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him, and apart from him nothing was made that has come into being. So here John, the writer of this gospel, used this Greek term logos. He uses the word logos to refer to the word of God. Now in Greek philosophy, the logos has two concepts. The concept of reason and the concept of speech. Thus, some Bible commentators claim that John was trying to show how Yeshua fulfilled the goals of Greek philosophy in both areas of reason and speech. By reason, he was the very idea of God, and by speech, he was the very expression of God. But as Arnold Fruchtenbaum, whose study I've drawn on for this message, he points out that it's all very well and good to say that, however, there is a major problem. Yochanan, or John, by profession, was not a Greek philosopher. He was a Jewish fisherman. 
What he really had in mind was not Greek philosophy, but Jewish theology, and Jewish theology of the first century in particular. When Yochanan wrote his gospel in Greek, he needed a Greek term to translate the Jewish term memra. And the only Greek term that he had was logos. But Yochanan did not mean the logos of Greek philosophy, rather he meant the memra of Jewish theology. The writings of the rabbis of the day taught that there were six special uh, actions that were true about the memra, six special teachings about the word of God. First of all, they said that the memra was sometimes the same as God, but sometimes it was distinct from God. The same, but distinct from God. The rabbis never tried to explain this, uh, and it seems like an obvious paradox. How was it possible for the memra on the one hand to be the same as God, but on the other hand, distinct from God? They simply taught that both statements are true, and it's left there. And this is the same thing in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. So the Word of God was pre-eternal, as God himself was. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word was with God, meaning he was distinct from God, but the Word was also with God, uh, was God, meaning he is God. By stating the Word was with God, it means Yeshua was distinct from God, by saying the word was God, it means Yeshua was the same as God. Like the rabbis, at this point, Yochanan did not try to explain away the obvious paradox. How is it possible for the word to be the same as God, yet be distinct from God? And this is the mystery of the triune nature of God. That is uh, further explained in the Gospel of John. The Logos is distinct from God in that he is not God the Father, nor is he God the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, but he is the same as God in that he is the second person of this triunity. He is God the Son and therefore the same as God. Only in the terms of the triunity can the rabbinic paradox of the Memra in Jewish theology be explained. Second, they teach that the the memra was also the agent of salvation. Sorry, the agent of creation. The agent of creation. Everything God created, he created by means of his memra, by means of his word. So without the memra, nothing would exist, would exist that now exists. So in John chapter 1, verse 3, we read, All things were made through him, and apart from him nothing was made, that has come into being. What is true of the memra in Jewish theology is true of the logos of whom John wrote. Everything was made through him, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so without him, nothing would exist that now exists. He is the agent of creation. Thirdly, the rabbis taught about the memra was that the memra was the agent of salvation. Whenever God saved throughout human history in the Tanakh, whether it was a physical salvation such as the exodus of Egypt or this, a spiritual salvation, God always saved by means of his memra, by his word. Therefore, John chapter 1 verse 12 says, but whoever did receive him, those trusting in his name, to these he gave the right to become the children of God. As with the memra in Jewish theology, so with the logos of John. He is the agent of salvation. Those who personally believe in his messiahship and receive him as savior are the ones who become children of God and receive spiritual salvation from him, the agent of salvation. And then the fourth thing that rabbis taught about the memra was that the memra was the agent or the means by which God became visible throughout the pages of the Tanakh. In theology, this phenomenon is called a theophany. It's a Greek word, theophany, an appearance of God. 
A theophany is the visible manifestation of God that occurred throughout history, and we see it a number of times throughout the Tanakh. The rabbis had a different term. They would refer to this as the Shekhinah, the appearance of the Shekhinah or the glory of God. The Shekhinah glory is the visible manifestation of God's presence. We talked about this at the Feast of Sukkot. Whenever the invisible God took on visible form, whether it, uh, whether, whenever the omnipresence of God became localized, when God, who is everywhere, became somewhere at one moment, throughout most of the Tanakh, it was the Shekhinah that took on form of perhaps light or cloud or some combination of these things. And according to the rabbis, this came by means of the memra, the word. And then again in John chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the word became flesh, and he tabernacled amongst us. We looked upon his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word, that is in verse 1, was in the beginning with God, always was with God and always was God. But at a certain point of human history, he took on visible form. But this time, he did not come in the form of light or fire or cloud. Rather, he came in the form of flesh. He was incarnated in flesh. He became human. He became a man. And Yeshua, as a man, was the visible manifestation of God's presence. He was 100% man and 100% God. This is why the book of Hebrews tells us the sun is the radiance of his glory and the imprint of his being. Yeshua was the Shekhinah, glory of God. He was the visible manifestation of God's presence. He is the source of light. He is the source of life for all men because he is the creator of all men. And then we also see that the Memra was the agent of revelation. And I've already mentioned this. Whenever God revealed himself, he always did so by means of his memra or his word who appeared to the prophets or even to Moses and throughout the scriptures. And so in John chapter 1, verse 18, we read, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only God in the Father's embrace has made him known. Yeshua came for the purpose of revealing the Father to men. As Yeshua said to Philip's question, show us the Father. One of the disciples said, show us the Father. And this is what Yeshua said. Have I been with you for so long a time and you haven't come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Everything that is true of the divine nature of the Father is also true of the divine nature of the Son because of his very nature he revealed the Father fully. And then finally, the sixth and last thing the rabbis taught about the memra was that the memra was a means by which God signed and sealed his covenants. In the Tanakh, there actually are eight covenants, three with the world in general and five with Israel in particular. His covenants, whether they were made with the world in general or with Israel in particular, were signed and sealed by means of the memra, by means of his word. The sixth point doesn't come out as clearly in the Gospel of John, but it's hinted at in verse 17. Torah was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. It is through Yeshua that the Brit Chadashah, this new covenant between God and Israel, and then later between God and also anyone from any of the nations, it was through Yeshua that this covenant came into effect and was sealed. It was through Yeshua shedding his blood on the cross that he sealed a new covenant and his grace extended to all peoples. All covenants had to be sealed with blood. And so Yeshua needed to shed his blood to seal a covenant. Just as the law was given to Israel and sealed by the manifestation of the Shekhinah of God on the Mount Sinai, so now Yeshua, the glory of God, the Shekhinah of God made flesh, seals the new covenant. 
Yochanan shows us that Yeshua came for the purpose of fulfilling all Jewish messianic hope. The six things that were taught about the Memra in rabbinic teaching is true of the one of whom John wrote about, Yeshua of Nazareth. He is the Memra. He is the Logos, the Word of God made flesh. So dear friends, Yeshua is the Word of God made flesh. He, uh, this speaks to us not only of the written Word, not only of the written Word which we hold as a, the Bible or maybe on our iPad, but Yeshua is the eternal word. He is much more than just the written word. The written word, of course, is part of his revelation, but he is much more than just the written word. He has been and always will be the word of God made flesh. And the word of God dwells in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The word of God is in us. And I want us to really take this to heart today, to think about this. The Word of God is in us through the Holy Spirit. And there's some verses I want us to, uh, to reflect on. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 says, I have written to you, children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known the One who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. The Word of God abides in in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Isn't that good? The word of God lives in us, not just the young ones. All of us. We're all young ones. But it's true. The word of God is in us. Be strong that the word of God abides in you. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this reason we also thank God constantly that when... You received the word of God which you heard from us. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as it truly is the word of God which does its work in you who believe. The word of God works in us. The word of God changes us. The word of God is taken by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and is used to transform us. It's at work in us. So when you're reading the word of God, God is reading you. Actually, when you're studying the Word of God, God is actually studying you. You can't put God on the table and study Him. Maybe theologians think they can do that in seminaries or universities, but God is studying us all the time. The Word of God works in us who believe. Colossians chapter 3.16 says, The Word of Messiah, sorry, let the Word of Messiah dwell in you richly. Let the Word of Messiah dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratitude in your hearts to God. Love that. The Word of God dwell in you richly. How do you do that? Well, it's by inviting God into your life, the Holy Spirit into your life, the Word of God into your life, and it's also by reading and studying and memorizing the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. You're never too young to memorize the Word of God, and you're never too old to memorize the Word of God. And that would be true for each one of us. Never too old. Don't just rely on the memories that, of the Word of God that you had from when you were young. Memorize it now, still today. Keep on memorizing the Word of God. Let the Word of God, the Word of Messiah, dwell in you richly. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, You have been born again. Not from perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. You've been born again through the living and enduring word of God. It's a living word. It's not words on the page, not words on the scroll. It's the living word that God writes in our hearts. And it's the enduring word. It will live forever. The grass Fades and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord stands forever, the prophet Isaiah tell, tells us. So that's why we can rejoice at Simchat Torah. Yeshua is the very word of God made flesh. It's not right to say that he is the Torah made flesh. Some people say that. He's much more than just the Torah made flesh. Some people like to use that at this time, say Yeshua is the Torah of God made flesh. Well, he's more 
than the Torah of God. He's the very word of God, the entire word of God. And he is still the very word of God. Not all of it was written down. He's much more that we don't have. But that is what lives in us through his power and through his Holy Spirit. So let's remember, we have life in us. And that life is through faith in Yeshua the Messiah. And he's put his word in us. And he speaks his life into us. He speaks his light. He speaks his wholeness into us. And it's through him we are born again. Amen. Let's just pray. Lord, thank you for today as we celebrate your word to us. We thank you for Torah, and we rejoice in Torah, but we thank you also for the Nevi'im, the prophets. And we thank you for the Ketuvim, the writings. And we thank you that all these parts of the Tanakh speak of Yeshua the Messiah that are fulfilled through the burial, death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. Thank you, Lord. For everything you have done for us, you are the agent of salvation. You are the agent of revelation. And it's through you that all things came into being. And so, Father, we thank you for sending Yeshua the Messiah, the word of God made flesh. And thank you for leaving us, your Ruach HaKodesh, to live in us until you come. We thank you, Lord, that we are longing for that time that you come. As we've been singing today, the word of the Lord shall go forth from Jerusalem. We long for that day when your word will go forth and bring peace to the nations, and nations will learn of war no more. Even as we have a sadness in our heart today, as we remember what happened a year ago at uh, Simchat Torah, a year ago, we thank you, Lord, that one day the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem, that nations will learn of war no more, There'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears for the old order of things that passed away. And so, Lord, we continue to trust you and continue to believe in you as we wait for your return and the restoration of all things. We bless you. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.